Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop, Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. on a week-to-week -week basis looking at 144 different nations, looking for the thousand best practices, technology, services, products, and the processes, of course, as we move through the 21st century. And so as we add 2 billion new people to the planet by 2050, in other words, being at about 9 billion people, how are we going to be able to take care of all their basic needs as well as to enhance the infrastructure that takes care of of the water, the power, everything else that's needed for humankind. And I have a gentleman sitting right beside me who's uh, been with us before. Uh, this is Dr. Linton. He goes by Lynn Wells II. And he's an expert and has been working for a number of years, we won't say how many years, that uh, on these whole things as far as how do we identify the technologies, the innovations, uh, the resiliency, the sustainability all around the globe. He's the executive advisor for C4I and Cyber Center out at the uh, Velgano School of Engineering at George Mason University and also the managing partner of Wells Analytics LLC. And Lynn, it's great to have you back. Sam, it's good to be here. Always good to have you. Tell us a little bit about uh, TIDES, what that actually means, because this goes to the heart of what we're talking about, is all this innovation, sustainability, resiliency. So TIDES is a U.S. Defense Department program, and it focuses on uh, sustainable solutions that can help build individual and community resilience to natural man-made disasters. As such, it supports four U.S. Defense Department missions. One is building the capacity of partner nations, uh, one is domestic and foreign disaster relief, and then there's stability and peacekeeping operations. So it uh, fits a valid DOD need. Yeah. It's only about information sharing. It doesn't bend metal. It doesn't pick winners and losers among companies. It just uh, shares information. Yeah, I think it's amazing what you've been doing. I've known you for a number of years now. And the whole thing about this is tides, and then we're going to talk about star tides in just a yeah. minute because, you know, that's a corollary of that, is that it just keeps expanding, and every year you bring more and different people in more and uh, more robust and um, resilient technologies and all this, which is absolutely fantastic that you keep finding all these different and unique people and they come from all over the planet. So, uh, you know, kudos to you for that. But star tides, what's the difference between star tides, what is it first, and then how is it different from tides? Well, so TIDE stands for Transformative Innovation for Development and Emergency Support. Uh, because it's only a knowledge sharing program, uh, the General Counsel of the Department of Defense has said you can have a website, star-tides.net, with which you can talk to anybody about pretty much anything in these areas. So long as we don't endorse one company over another, and so long as we don't make any funding commitments or things like that. So the Star Tides Network has now grown to several thousand members around the world, from universities in Asia to NGOs in Europe and Africa to the Red Cross, U.S. Marine Corps. It's become public-private, whole-of-government, transnational. Mm -hmm. So that's the, so Star Tides, the knowledge sharing network. Tides is the government program. Uh, and the first part of TIDES is how do you leverage the global talent that's inherent in the network. Yeah, looking at this, and I know that you have actually a fourth uh, circle that goes into this whole design. Tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here and how does that really relate to the things that we're talking about at the very beginning. We're adding two billion new people to the planet. We need to make sure that they're well cared for, not just existing. And this is really, I believe, goes to the heart of what all this is about. So the origin of tides was a simple question. How do people die? Six ways. Too hot, too cold, hunger, thirst, illness, injury. So too hot, too cold is a problem of shelter, heating, and cooling. Hunger, thirst is a supply chain problem. Uh, illness, injury is a public safety, security, public health problem. Mm -hmm. So based on that, tides has been looking at 10 infrastructures. So shelter, water, power, integrated combustion, solar cooking uh, for places that are deforested like Haiti and Darfur, heating, cooling, sanitation, lighting, lots of information and communications technologies, and then life support and logistics. So the next part of this is how do you promote 
integrated approaches among those 10 infrastructures. How do you position the sanitation so it doesn't contaminate the water? How do you use the heat from the cooking to pasteurize the water? That kind of thing. And then the third circle on there is everything the project does is focused on the needs of local populations and their worlds with their resources. Not interested in a bright, shiny, expensive American solution that's inoperative six months after you deploy it. So how can you find solutions that are sustainable through the local private sector and doesn't leave them dependent on AID or World Bank, whatever loans going forward? Now looking at that, uh, most people would say, well, in most cases you want to depend on the government. This is outside, of course, the borders of the United yeah. States. But yet you really reverse that saying that we really want to have the private sector to be the leaders, to be involved in, you know, this, in essence, transformational technology, resilient, robust, and all that. So how do you communicate that to the world, saying that the private sector really can be a colleague and at the same time really needs to be involved in what's going on? So if you look at the velocity of change in so many technologies now, if some pick a parameter, uh, computing power per unit cost, if that doubles about every 18 months, okay? in a year and a half you have 100% more capacity and capability. Mm -hmm. But in five years it's 900%, in 10 years it's 10,000%, and by 2030 it's 100,000% more capability. Mm -hmm. And this is being done in the private sector. And then biotechnology is changing even faster than information. Robotics are becoming ubiquitous. Nanotechnology is breaking out. Uh, energy underpins everything. So I like to think in terms of brine. Bio, robo, info, nano, energy, mm -hmm. and the intersection among those. And now you add 3D printing and things like that. So the question is, given that all these technologies and these developments are going on in the private sector, this is not led by governments. This is not led by Defense Department R&D as it was in the past. So it's important to have into that and make it available to the local populations. And this leads to really something, this global innovation exchange. I know this is something that actually has started here, but again, it's going global at the same time. What is that all about? So global innovation exchange rolled out, I believe, in July of this year, uh, and it's uh, basically trying to link up uh, innovators and funders and kind of collaborators who review ideas and things like that. Uh, it's uh, led by organizations like USAID, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, National Science Foundation, MIT Lincoln Labs, and so on and so forth, about over 100 organizations. And the nice thing is that it's well funded. It's funded at like over $190 million. Mm. A significant amount of investment. And so the idea this. is they have about 4,000 innovation ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do you then, uh, okay, uh, it'll advertise, we have funds available for water purification in Tanzania or mm -hmm. something like that. Right. Okay. Who would be interested in doing that? Or uh, somebody says, I have an idea for uh, you know, more advanced solar energy panels. Is so it's almost like a broadcast. You send it out there it's into a the network. It's an innovation right. marketplace. Got it. And so in this, I mean, StarTide would then become a participant in this. You'd still have the StarTide on that website. But when you went there, you'd now be directed into this. And so the participants in StarTides now have advantage of all the different opportunities opportunities within Global Innovation Exchange. Yeah, and that goes back to the heart of something you said before, that you can't pick winners and losers. And many times you have governments that try to do that, right. particularly if it's a domesticated, whether it's in India, China, Australia, doesn't matter what it is, they're looking at it. So how do you go about this so that it's actually totally neutral, it allows everybody the same access, and then they pick and choose and they decide which is going to be you know, their own particular winner as far as dealing or being able to bid on a project in a specific country? Well, so two things. One is, for me, one of the best examples is, is a Canadian general came by a few years ago and looked at one of our demonstrations and said, this all looks very interesting. What do you have that works minus 30 degrees, 30 knot winds, and permafrost? To which my answer was, duh. <laughs> Went out to the network. And people came back in hours and said, I have a contract with the Inuits for green energy in Alaska. I have a contract with the government of the Yukon. Took them together, hooked them up with the Canadians, let them work it out. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to micromanage a solution. We're just, think of it as a speed dating service. Mm -hmm. People have problems, people have solutions, come together. And so another example is the Middle Eastern government called up a while back and said, I need help with refugee camps in a couple of our cities. Mm -hmm. Went back out, within a week, we had 80 different members of the network who said, I have technology I might contribute, 
I've served there, so on and so forth. And again, the idea is, went back to the government, said this needs to be your lead, not ours, so let us know who, which ministry, which whatever, and then we'll support you. Now looking at these uh, technology expansion, you have something that's called Starfish. Hmm. And so what is Starfish and how does that fit in with Tides and Star Tides? So there's a book called The Starfish and the Spider. And the general gist of it is if you cut the head off a spider, the spider dies. If you cut the arm off a starfish, it generates a new arm. Mm -hmm. So the idea was how do you disperse the concept of star tides beyond just a few people at National Defense University in Washington mm -hmm. to have you know, different people working on it for their needs in their cultures and their languages. So it looks like the first star tides starfish network is going to be in Japan. And they are working on public um, emergency health and disaster medicine. And so they will be affiliated with Star Tides Network. Mm -hmm. um, and so anything we do will be shared with them. But they can work their, their projects in Japanese with Japanese procedures, Japanese people. Anything they'd like to share back with us, uh, we'll take. The only thing we ask is the same rules. We do not favor one company over another and, and don't make commitments. So that would be the idea of a Starfish Network in other countries and other, like the International Red Cross has been considering something like this as well. Well, we're about running out of time. And so let's go over this chart right quick, what mm -hmm. this actually means, what it means to people around the globe. And then the end of that is what do you see for the growth and expansion of tides and star tides over the next 5, 10, 15 years? So these are the four mission areas that tides support. Building the capacity of partner nations, uh, defense support of civil authorities is U.S. domestic disaster relief, humanitarian assistance disaster relief is foreign in this case, and then stability security transition is peacekeeping operations. So those are the four mission areas that tides and star tides support. So what I would hope is um, the, the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey has expressed an interest uh, in their innovation center at Sabrowski Institute of picking up more relationship with the government tides. Mm -hmm. uh, we've mentioned Star Tides uh, become more closely associated with Global Innovation Exchange and also the George Mason uh, University uh, may become more closely associated with Star Tides. So we look we see more diversification bring in additional innovation and that's why I see us going forward. Yeah well what is for Lynn Wells over the next 5, 10, 15 years? You've done tremendous things your whole life, and it seems like you actually are sprinting now and uh, accelerating ahead. You've got about 15, 20 seconds. Well, so our model right now is a third of the time volunteering giving back, a third time family, third time business. So this is one of the volunteering pieces. That's absolutely, absolutely fantastic. This is Dr. Linton, goes by Lynn Wells II, Executive Advisor, C4I, and the Cyber Center at the Volgano School of Engineering, George Mason University, and also managing partner of Wells Analytics. And thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. My pleasure. Saving for retirement might be easy for some folks, but for others, it might take a little more work. And for those who haven't started, there are still things you can do to catch up. Oh, that is good news. Like getting out from underneath past debt. And don't get wrapped up with high interest credit cards. Let's get you some eyes. Be diversified with your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Your financial goals are not out of reach. The choice is clear. For a happy ending, choose to save. Everyone with alcohol and drug addiction is in the same boat. treatment, you can find solid ground. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Dude, are you sure you want this tattoo? Because, just do it! Some mistakes in life are permanent, like hearing loss. To learn how to protect your hearing, visit ASHA.org. You've probably heard about heart disease, but did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? 
Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer or strokes combined. But there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. To the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet as we're looking around the globe for those thousand best practices, what we call the best of the best, the technology, services, products, and processes that are making a difference as we go through the 21st century. And as we have a century that's going to grow by 9 billion people by 2050, maybe 12 to 13 billion by the end of the century, how are we going to be able to increase the quality of life, increase the quality of life, and not just allow people to exist? And as we know, there's right Right now, maybe three and a half billion of almost half of the adult population around the globe that doesn't even have proper sanitation. And so how do we find that and all the other technologies that are really needed for that? And I have a gentleman sitting right beside me. This is Dr. Brett uh, Strogan. He's the visiting scholar from the University of California, UC Berkeley, and uh, energy innovation analyst. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Millennium Engineering and Integration, MEI company. Welcome. Thank you, glad to be here. Glad to have you with us, uh, Brett. Tell us a little bit about your work, both as a visiting scholar from the University of California, Berkeley, and then also this energy innovation analyst. I like that title. Tell us about <laughs> like both that. of those and how it fits in the fact of uh, we're here talking about tides and star tides, right. which I'm gonna have you define in just another minute sure. or two. Um, so I should start out that I, I was a researcher at UC Berkeley until 2013 at the Energy Bioscience Institute, and the visiting scholar appointment allows me to continue some of the great work I was doing out there mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Professor David Zilberman. Um, the main gist of that research is looking at the differences in different in alternative fuels, primarily ethanol compared to gasoline, and what the implications are for the infrastructure, for the engines, for the end user, uh, and looking at what, what the implications are as well for the environment and, and economics. Uh, so looking at the two different fuels and looking at new infrastructure that might be needed to support alternative fuels as they're coming out. Well, looking at this, this is very interesting. You're, you're a visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley, yep. so you have this academic foot right. that you have out there. And then also you're in the private sector, so how right. do you balance uh, being at the university and having this uh, private sector work and make those mesh so that it makes sense to both communities, because you know sometimes they exist in stovepipes, right? And one doesn't really talk to the other all the time. Is that part of your job? Right. I mean, there, there. I have to avoid conflict of interest, that kind of uh, issue. But there is some overlap in the, I guess, the this strategy that I'm looking at these different problems with. So with MEI company, I'm primarily looking at. Uh, drop-in biofuels, so different than ethanol, but still in the biofuels uh, area. So looking at drop-in jet fuels and diesel fuels, which are still very, it's a very nascent industry, still coming online and looking at what technologies are coming out and how we're going to certify and test engines to use those new fuels. Also looking at new technologies for, for supplying energy to remote bases, so something like uh, small nuclear reactors has come up a lot. That's uh, a so very interesting yeah, topic. I'm sure a, a lot of people, one. all of a sudden the radar goes on when you start talking about right, these a lot of questions nuclear to devices. Answer. Yes. Yep, yep. Right. At looking at the uh, the tides, what is, does the acronym tides uh, actually stand for? And then I know that it's something, that, and I, I go to these yearly Great. out at National Defense University, which is a very fine university and uh, really is reaching out way beyond the defense community, right. and civil society, and, and also disaster planning and recovery and all that. But what is the tides and then how do these field demonstrations at NDU really fit together as far as the TIDES mission and the goals and objectives. Okay, so TIDES is Transformative Innovation for Development and Emergency Support. Um, so it's really a knowledge sharing network. It was in, initiated out of the National Defense University where the, where the, the demo is hosted. Um, the, the demonstrations themselves out in the field are you can imagine it being similar to what a, a disaster response situation might be like. It's this open field, very little infrastructure. So uh, technology providers come there with, to show off their new technologies to folks that might not otherwise see them. So solar panels, shelters that you can assemble in, in an hour or two, um, satellite dishes to, to get communication going. So you can have a, a fully functioning little uh, 
little base there uh, within. You know, well, within you say a, day. a base, but also if you look at it as far as civil society, it's really it's a village right there. And it was interesting. I was out there uh, last year, I guess, the first day they were setting out, and so you had a guy he drove in, he unloaded everything. This was mm -hmm. for you know potable water, and he what he did, he immediately took his hose and ran all the way down the Potomac River, dropped it in, right. ran back up, turned his machine on, and he started serving water to people. Right. I mean, it was. I don't know if it was 30 minutes for the whole thing. It was just amazing. Right, and I think a lot of DC locals would be uh, hesitant to, to drink water coming out of the Potomac, but there's technologies out there that can make, make water from that river or any other that's clean, and we want to you know, show, show off those technologies if folks are aware of it. Now, looking at this, you know, the whole thing is, you know, it's water and uh, energy, sanitation, uh, telecommunications, all these things really go to the heart of modern society. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it's in the middle of uh, Uganda or uh, El Salvador door or downtown Paris, France, is right. that you need a certain base so that people actually do have a quality of life. So looking at these uh, field demonstrations you have there, how does that really fit in? So when you show up, how should you approach that? Do you just go vendor to vendor? Or are you looking at it as an integrated system? How does these uh, field demonstrations work the best? for people that come and participate. I think it is valuable to see the vendors interact with each other. So you could have uh, the, the solar panel or wind, you know, small unit wind power companies providing power for the other units. Electricity is an easy one. Everyone needs electricity, mm -hmm. even for the, um, you know, for water treatment, stuff like that. Uh, but I'd say a lot of the, the folks coming are looking for something, you know, something in particular. So they might try to focus on the, the, the comms uh, technologies yeah, or the, or the communications, shelters. Right. 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 So that's, it's all there. It's, it's pretty, um, yeah, as you can see, there's 10 infrastructures that Tides focuses on, and there's something for everyone, I mm -hmm. guess you could say. Um, so the vendors also tend to form good relationships with each other just by walking around, seeing what else is out there, um, and form relationships that they might go into business in, in the future with. Well, the interesting thing I felt like last year is that you had the, uh, the computer software, you had the telecommunications, and then you had two or three other technologies that all of a sudden they started networking each other because one of them lost his computer. Mm -hmm. And so he just went next door and said, hey, can you do this? you know, about five or 10 minutes, uh, he was back up and running and he was running off the energy of the guy next door. And of course, this fellow was down here, you know, passing out water. Right. It's just amazing. Uh, you're really doing the integration there. So looking at, we talked about tides and mm -hmm. then there's also the star tides. Right. Tell us a little bit about that. And then how that really goes to heart of this uh, prototyping, experimentation, and also the fielding aspect of this. In other words, get it there, get it up quick. Right. So it's absolutely operating and and you know, reduce the you know the pain and misery for the people who really need it. Right. And so, so tides is, is the uh, the effort out of NDU. Um, that's the what through the uh, through which the demo is, is hosted. Star tides is at the global network. So there's a, a website, Star tides. So that's really trying to tap into the the resources and and the interests and needs uh, in other countries outside of America and really get the interagency and, and international collaboration going. Um, as far as the, the, the rapid prototyping and, and experimentation, I'd say the Tides does support some, some new technologies that are you know, early prototypes. Uh, the ex experimentation side, like you say, there, mm -hmm. there can be unplanned experiments taking place on, on the demo site itself. Uh, just showing, showing users how these, these things work, uh, potential customers, you know, whether it's military or uh, FEMA workers, seeing that it, that it, that it you know, maybe test it out or at least taste the water, like you're saying. That's I just thought it was really fantastic. This was all really happening on the fly because the guy's computer went down. You know, people, it was a really hot day, so people were looking for water. There was not enough water out there. All of a sudden, he said, well, try some of mine. And, you know, why not? You know, <laughs> right. it's, that's what you're here for. So uh, it was just really interesting that you can actually go there, you see it, but you actually e experience right. at the same time. And people think, remember that a lot better. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the whole thing, you know. But uh, you're also involved with this uh, Naval uh, Postgraduate School out of Monterey, California. And so you have a lot of academic <laughs> and military uh, connections here, but something called the Joint Interagency Field Experiments. What is that? And then how does that really relate to the Navy? Because that's, you know, this postgraduate naval school. Right. So I should be clear, I don't have a leadership role in, in the JFX, but uh, I, I find it very interesting. And there's a relationship with, with Tides. It's um, not all that uh, dissimilar in that they're both um, field sites where new technologies are, are showcased. But the JFX, or JFX as mm -hmm. it's often called, uh, it happens every quarter. So it's a lot more frequent than t the Tides demo in DC, which is once a year. 
Uh, and the, the uh, GIFICs will have a specific theme every quarter. So it might be autonomous systems. One time it might be maritime port defense. Another time, and that's, so it's more specified. And they have a call for, for white papers. And, and it's a lot more, uh, and there's more, I guess, focused in, in planning and then carrying out the demonstration where they'll do experiments with uh, different systems. So looking at GIFICs, I know that this is something that uh, many people don't really realize. The, the U.S. military in toto really is the largest humanitarian aid organization on the planet, mm -hmm. bar none. And people find that hard to believe, but you think about, you know, tsunami went all over Southeast Asia and, you know, the ships were sailing in there almost, you know, right after it happened. Right. And then they were dropping supplies and, you know, protecting places and things like that. So looking at this uh, post Graduate school in Monterey, uh, you know, affiliated with the Navy. How does how does how do they actually support something like this? Both the tides and the star tides, so it really translates to the greater community. Because you think the military is kind of this insular, mm -hmm. you know, standoffish organization, and it really is the, almost the exact opposite of that. It's very interactive. Right. And the, someone, uh, Dr. Lynn Wells, who uh, has you know been with us before, mm -hmm. and uh, he just really wants every everybody to have this opportunity to be interact and to learn about the innovation, resiliency, and sustainability and all that. So how does that all fit so that everybody can, you know, mentally understand <laughs> this? Right. So I guess the, the one other point I should mention, you asked about the, the relevance to the Navy of, of this site. So the, the one unique aspect also of the, the Camp Roberts site is that they can have maritime and land uh, uh, exercises going on. So there, there is a maritime element to it as well at times. Um, but the, while the the, the GIFX focus is largely um, the military combatant command led, there is some overlap in terms of the needs of, of the broader community, the disaster response within um, the United States or, or elsewhere. So uh, GIS uh, tools and, and applications is one good um, kind of uh, lesson that, that is that kind of showcases how, how there is relevance between the civil and military partnership and how these technologies from the commercial sector can be used elsewhere. So. Um, you can think in a disaster response situation, you want as much information as possible from a, a, an aerial surveillance perspective. Right. So folks have learned that you can use uh, planes and images that are be kept, being captured for a commercial sec, uh, sector, use, uh, it, take that information and highlight where the priorities are. Um, so using both information sources from the military and, and civilian uh, applications cannot end up being very useful for, for both. Fantastic. Well, we just ran out of time. Oh. You do, you do a very nice <laughs> job. But anyway, one last question. Looking at tides, star tides, and the uh, GIFX, how do you see them meshing together and actually expanding and growing, say, over the next 5, 10, 15 years? Well, the, the one latest development. to be quick. OK, quick. Uh, through, through the internet is, is the one uh, way, of course, that we want to expand through the Global in in Innovation Exchange. Um, but I'd say also lever taking advantage of the new technologies that are coming out there, 3D printing, uh, new apps, et cetera. So oh, I tell you, the 3D printing is just absolutely incredible. This is Dr. Brett uh, Strogan. She is the visiting scholar, University of California, UC Berkeley, and also energy uh, innovation analyst, Millennium Engineering and uh, Integration, MEI. Thank you for being here. And thank you as we look around the globe to create Emerald Planet. turn my child's public school into a whole new kind of school. One with a curriculum that really motivates kids. One that has extended hours, six days a week, year round. With loads of academic, cultural, and recreational activities. One that has support services, like medical and dental, right there. A school where parents' involvement is encouraged, where teachers have more time to teach, and students are excited about learning. There's just one problem. My child doesn't ever want to come home. You can help turn your school into a community school for excellence. Find out how. Call 1-877-LOVE-TO-LEARN. It's coming right to your neighborhood. And when it does, you may be surprised. It's your social security statement of your benefits, and it's going to help you plan your financial future. Your benefit statement will tell you how much social security you're eligible to receive, 
and when you'll get it. Then you'll know how much you need to save for retirement. Because that's coming too. The future is in your hands. Choose to save. The toxic fumes from this meth lab are seeping into Jamie's sinus cavity. Ammonia vapors invade her throat. Toxic gases fill her lungs. Jamie's body is deteriorating. And she doesn't even know it. Jamie, dinner. So, who has the drug problem now? Find out how meth affects you at drugfree.org slash... to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week basis looking around the globe as we call for the best of the best, looking for those technologies, services, products, and processes that are making a difference as we go through the 21st century. And as we keep adding more and more people to the planet, we have to innovate and to, at the same time, create more technologies that are sustainable, that are resilient, and actually can increase the quality of life. And I have a gentleman sitting right beside me who has uh, many years of experience and uh, taking things apart, putting them back together, and then making sure that they work for the people who really need it. This is Dr. Uh, James. He goes by Jim Emery, who is a visiting senior research fellow at the Institute of National Strategic Studies, National Defense University in Washington, D.C. And uh, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, it sounds like from your background, we chatted a little bit earlier, mm-hmm. that you've been visiting a lot of different places over your whole career and have been mm-hmm. involved in many different things. But one thing that's very interesting that um, most people actually don't know about, even though most of us you know, here in the TV mm-hmm. station do, uh, National Defense University. Mm-hmm. So what is it? And then going back to this Institute of National Strategic Studies, what mm-hmm. does that really mean and how is that part of into you. Sure. Well, the National Defense University is, is of course, a very broad institution. It encompasses uh, all aspects of the joint force for professional military education. It also is a unique institution in the fact that it brings all the services together along with the interagency to look at things, uh, challenges and problems for the United States government, not just simply from a military standpoint, but also from the informational, uh, diplomatic, uh, developmental standpoints. And really it, it teaches and schools our senior military leaders in conjunction with some of our emerging interagency leaders uh, on how it is that best we can develop holistic solutions to very complex international problems that are facing us right now. You know, the whole thing about this, many people think of the military, okay, let's go you know, blow up something, let's go chase somebody, what have mm-hmm. you. But actually what you're talking about is a center It's very academic, Mm -hmm. and so they're really focused on academic quality, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's really almost like a thought center, is how I understand Mm -hmm. how Mm -hmm. National Defense University has really organized Mm -hmm. itself, you know, has core areas, of course, related to the military and others. But what you've talked about, you're talking about the the diplomatic, the civil society, Mm -hmm. you're talking about really the whole society Mm -hmm. that's in National Defense University. How Mm -hmm. does all that fit together? Well, as we see in the world today, there is not just simply a military problem. There's not just simply a governmental or uh, political problem. And there's not just simply a developmental problem. It's really a, a combination of all three that have to be brought together. And whenever we think in terms of solving, solving and dealing with some of the challenges throughout the world, military leaders in particular who have a very good background in security efforts uh, have to be brought together with those that, uh, those that you know, uh, have the ability to look at things from the political perspective mm-hmm. as well as the developmental, developmental and also the humanitarian and civil society perspectives. And really, if we're going to develop comprehensive, holistic, lasting solutions out the world, the, th- the fourth thing we have to bring together is a really solid understanding of the host nation, Mm-hmm. who it is we'll be dealing with because in the end every problem and challenge that we deal with is really a host nation solution that we only facilitate and support. Yeah and we're looking at that right here 
I believe this is uh, either Pakistan or Afghanistan. But the whole thing is, is that you have many countries where there's just an absolute lack of uh, energy, you mm -hmm. know, throughout the whole nation because putting up grids is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's very interesting of what you're doing at National Defense University, but also you're working with the United States Agency for International Development, mm -hmm. and this is what called the Global Innovation Exchange, yes. which I know that's something that's very Im important. So what is that initiative, and then how does that relate back to what you're doing to something we're going to soon talk about is like the tides and the star tides? Absolutely, great question. The uh, Global uh, Innovation Exchange is really an initiative that came out of the U.S. Agency for International Development's Global Development Laboratory. And it recognizes that in a globally interconnected world that the solutions to the challenges of that world should be exactly the same, should be global, should be interconnected, and should be dem democratized and really open to all for participation. One of the key things that uh, comes out of this is really success is dependent upon two things. The first thing is, is you have to have adaptive, innovative solutions that then in turn, number two, can be brought in, uh, in contact with those really that have the, the solutions and the resources to solve those problems. And really the Global Innovation Exchange is designed to be a very open source, inclusive, democratized uh, exchange forum mm -hmm. that brings together not only government and business, but also academia, civil society, non-governmental organizations, all bringing them together because everyone has a different perspective on the challenges and it bring together different perspectives on what the solutions can be. Mm -hmm. And then in turn linking those with, su with sufficient resources, resources to actually then to be able to tackle those problems. And this, this global innovation exchange has over a hundred international organizations involved. That is incredible, Jim. That's absolutely incredible to mm -hmm. have that many. And of course, I understand through what we'll soon be talking about, tides and star tides, there's probably several thousands in there. So, I mean, you really are involved, reaching out and involving the whole globe. But Absolutely. you've used this term, uh, democracy, democratizing, uh, mm -hmm. several different times. You know, some governments get a little antsy when you start talking about that, <laughs> and yet you're working in these very uh, robust but also demanding environments uh, mm -hmm. in, by climate, by civil strife, by, you know, all kinds of ethnic ethnicities in those areas, mm -hmm. diversity. So how do you use this term so that it really has a common thread of understanding mm -hmm. as you go across all these different nation states mm -hmm. and different groups within these nation states? Well, I think the heart of democratization is inclusivity, bringing everyone into the discussion, and then also valuing their inputs and their, their solutions equally. Mm -hmm. Because one of the challenges that we faced in development in previous years is it's largely been an institutional and governmental, governmental Governmental uh, process. Really, what the Global Informa Innovation Exchange seeks to do is bring all the good ideas from the smallest to the largest, knowing that really a good idea can come from anyone, anywhere, and at any time. And when you bring those that type of those ideas together, that would normally have to percolate up through a a very very set system, and might not even make it to the top. The GIE just as in the same way as with our Star Tides network, really seeks to get at the, the challenges as quickly as possible, develop the solutions, and then put those into practice for maximum benefit of those involved. Mm -hmm. We normally talk about National Defense University, we talk about tides and star tides, and mm -hmm. you know this, of course. Mm -hmm. You know Dr. Lynn Wells, who's uh, been on Emerald Planet TV and mm -hmm. is an outstanding individual and, and really is kind of the the Energizer Bunny that uh, created that whole sure. thing and keeps it going. But looking at it from the standpoint, let's go to the other side, USAID mm -hmm. and this uh, Global Innovation Exchange mm -hmm. initiative. How does that then fold into or does it collaborate side by side with mm -hmm. the tides and star tides and what would be mm -hmm. the tide star tides, short definition of that, sure. and then how it fits into this UAID, USAID model. Sure, and I think the thing that, uh, that makes both of these efforts a great fit for one another is the fact that it's all about it's all about problem solving, it's all about innovation, and it's all about action. Because the <coughs> the thing that makes both of these efforts a great fit for one another, the Global Innovation Exchange brought together with the sharing to accelerate research and transformative innovation 
intelligence pieces that we have within the Star Tides network really make it a good fit because as, as we looked at both these efforts, we saw that they have a lot of commonality and structures. The first thing is both of them have a database and a research base that provides the information needed for innovation to innovation to occur. The second thing is it has a directory. It knows how to bring the bring people together to create solutions, uh, to organize communities of interest and co communities of effort. The third thing it is is, is it has a a portal, uh, a portal or a a content a, a portal. Uh, capability that then in turn puts the right ideas out in front of allows people in order to, allows the access but mm -hmm. allows people to see what other people are doing and then the last thing of this is it has really an infrastructure and a and a in some peop cases people would call it a classified section just knowing what other people are doing and who are interested in how and who you can tap into both of them have this so i mean when we looked at these two bringing star tides into into the global uh, the global innovation exchange mm -hmm. just made great sense. Yeah, I, I think that's really uh, well spoken there as far as you know, the how and the why and all that. Mm -hmm. Now looking at it, many times you'll have administrators in different organizations, you know, the proverbial snow pipes mm -hmm. and, and all that. So how do you approach the leadership with these two different organizations say, mm -hmm. hey, we've got something here that we really need to be collaborating on because really in today's world it's all mm -hmm. about collaboration and working together to make mm -hmm. things happen because none of us have all the best ideas, we don't have all the best technologies, but mm -hmm. if we can collaborate, we can help each mm -hmm. other. So how do you allow within these organizations that the top management inside the organization mm -hmm. feels like it wants to reach out, embrace, and bring all of this together. But I think there's a commonality though between what we see within the business industry uh, with what we're seeing within the developmental, the development industry. It's the fact that most great solutions don't come from the top down as inspired wisdoms from senior leaders. Mm -hmm. They really come from the bottom up from those that are in contact with the problems, dealing with the challenges, that simply if you will put the right people together, they can come up with the solution, propose it upward, gain the support and resources that they need that then in turn you can quickly move great ideas into great solutions. Okay, we are running out of time. Mm -hmm. When you have this kind of dialogue, you're just doing absolutely fantastic. But looking at National Defense University, mm -hmm. how do you see over the next five or ten years that it's going to expand its outreach as far as the innovation, resiliency, mm -hmm. and collaboration and all that? And then how do you fit in all this with your very distinguished career, and yet you still want to do more and more. And we mm -hmm. have about one minute to do all of that. I think, it's, I think it would be two things. First of all, is the military, uh, the military and security uh, organizations for the United States are all about innovation, change, and adapting, not just to get in front of problems, but to get in front of solutions for the future. And I, I feel very proud to be a part of that. The second part of that is technology has always got a, it always has a, a key aspect of that. Well, I think it's fantastic. And then your fit. What do you see for Jim? My personal fit, I mm -hmm. think, is just simply to uh, being being a little bit older, a little bit experienced, simply to facilitate some of the good ideas that are coming out of the people with a lot more experience in current events than I have today. That's absolutely fantastic. Dr. James Jim Emery, Visiting Senior Research Fellow, Institute of Research Strategic uh, Studies at the National Defense University. Thank you for being here. This is absolutely fantastic, Jim. And uh, you well exceeded your billing about all the knowledge that you have to share with us. Thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. One day these rats were playing in the woods. One day some matches and that's no good. Yeah. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about green dogs. Like nothing very nice. I'm a homeless man. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire! Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? 
more time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Oh. 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 Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week to week basis as we say looking for the best of the best around the whole globe. Even though we really focus in 144 different nations we're actually reaching into through the Emerald Planet TV into all 214 countries and territories to find what really needs to be done, what needs to be used and how to make it available to people around the globe. And I have a gentleman sitting right beside me who uh, is with us uh, actually on a fairly regular basis, I must say, Lynn. This is Dr. Linton. He goes by Lynn Wells II, Executive Advisor, C4I and Cyber Center at the uh, Volgeno School of Engineering at George Mason University and also is a managing partner of Wells Analytics. And Lynn, welcome back. It's good to be back, Sam. It's always good to have you here. And how we really met initially was through what was then called Star Tides and then Tides, and now it's back to Star Tides and Tides. And uh, tell us a little bit about these two. And then, since we've known each other now for quite a number of years, I want to talk about the kinds of things that you really see for beyond the horizon that's coming out of this, and also the collaboration with USAID and their global initiatives before as well. So TIDES is the U.S. Defense Department program. It stands for Transformative Innovation for Development and Emergency Support. It supports four uh, mission areas of the Department of Defense, building the capacity of uh, partner nations, domestic and foreign disaster relief, and uh, peacekeeping and stability operations. It's only about knowledge sharing. It doesn't bend metal, it doesn't win, pick, pick winners and losers among companies. And because of that, our general counsel said we can have a network, startides.net, with which we can talk to most anybody about anything. So by now, the Star Tides Network has grown to several thousand members, and as the, the graphic shows, and people can see it there, they're in uh, universities in Asia, they're uh, NGOs in Europe and Africa, it's got the Red Cross, it has U.S. Marine Corps, so it's public-private, whole of government, transnational. Again, just about information sharing. Now looking at this, this is something that came out of a mutual friend of ours who's uh, not with us uh, in this program, but uh, Jim Kraft uh, came, uh, came to you with this idea and said, this is something that I think we really ought to be doing. And of course, this thing has just blossomed. It's just absolutely amazing the work that you've done with this through National Defense University. So what was, what was that intriguing hook? Because many times senior administrators, which you were, could just say dismiss it out of hand or say no we you know we're too busy I don't have enough time but yet you actually actively embrace this this tides and star tides so, and you've really gone you know three and four steps beyond anything that I think anybody would ever imagine. So a couple things so Jim's idea and Jim the thing I admire about Jim he's someone who walks the walk he had been the information communications technology advisor in Afghanistan and while he was there, he observed the need for integration of some of the technologies which have turned into ties. Uh, I had at that point spent uh, uh, several years in relatively senior positions in the Office of Secretary of Defense, mostly in information communications technology. 
And one of the things I got extremely frustrated about was you get very channelized, even at senior level. So you're the IT person. Why are you worried about water? Why are you worried about shelter? Why are you worried about power? Got things it. like that. And so I said, if I ever got some place where I could do cross-cutting work, I'd like to do it. Well, National Defense University, which I transitioned to shortly after Jim brought me the idea, uh, and by the way, he then transitioned back into government, so he couldn't do it from his position, so it's a good opportunity, it was a perfect place to do that, because uh, you can sort of tie all these things together, and if somebody questions, you plead fuzzy as an academic, and <laughs> I didn't know I couldn't do that, and so go on. You know, Beg forgiveness and, instead of asking permission. permission yeah. uh, so uh, sorry, it was the integrating ability at, at NDU. Uh, the basic question of star tides, as it turned out, was how do people die? So six ways, too hot, too cold, hunger, thirst, illness, injury. But you know, it's interesting. I want to stop you there for a minute. I've heard this from you a number yeah. of times. And usually everybody's trying to think about how do we sustain, you know, all these yeah. other things. But you actually really started at, you know, which is really the awakening moment is how do people die and then backing into it. So what does that, what kind of insight did that, does that give you that's different, that's special, that allowed the tides and star tides to now expand all over the planet. And you've got thousands of organizations in, but thousands of others wanting to be in the network. Well, so I have a, the concept is really from a British friend, Vinay Gupta, about the six ways people die. Uh, and the point is that, hung, that um, too hot, too cold is a, is a uh, shelter heating and cooling problem. Mm -hmm. Hunger and thirst is a supply chain problem, and illness injury is a problem of uh, public safety, security, public health. So we started looking at infrastructures that supported those. And after some, uh, it's evolved over time, but where it is now is 10 infrastructures. So uh, power, shelter, and water, the integration of combustion and solar cooking for places like Darfur, Haiti, Afghanistan, they're deforested. Mm -hmm. The heating, cooling, sanitation, lighting, lots of information and communication technologies, uh, life support and logistics. So those kind of cover the, the six questions. And um, the question then was, how do you combine the knowledge in the global startage network with an approach that integrates these different infrastructures? Mm -hmm. So how would you position the water so it doesn't affect the sanitation? How would you use the heat from the cooking to pasteurize the water? Maybe put rocks and bricks, heat rocks and bricks to put in shelters, so you don't have fires in enclosed spaces, things like that. So the idea of integrated thinking. And then the last piece, because the missionaries were looking at, we're interested in solutions that work for local populations in their worlds with their resources. Mm -hmm. Not interested in a bright, shiny American solution that's mm -hmm. inoperative if you deploy it. So how do you find something that can be sustained by a local population without relying on World Bank or USAID loans forever? So those are kind of the underlying points. And the last is that no lesson is ever learned until behavior changes. Typhoon comes by, you observe a lesson. Mm -hmm. Next typhoon, you reobserve the same lesson. Mm -hmm. So, how do you train, educate, exercise, and provide incentives to cause people to do things differently so you can really say, ah, we've learned that lesson rather than just observed another one? I want to let you just, I yeah. love the way you're taking off on this, it's fantastic, but I want to. Uh, kind of branch off from this, looking at the, the water food. Mm -hmm. You talked about this as, as a supply chain issue. Right. But I think most people in the NGOs and the development community will say, no, we're not producing enough. You know, we don't have enough food. You know, we're producing too many children, so it's really a po population issue and all that. When we look at statistics, they're saying we're already producing enough food for maybe 13 to 14 billion people on the planet, mm -hmm. but we're just wasting half of it. So this really kind of circles back to your whole notion of the supply chain. Looking at that, you know, one factoid there, how does that relate to all these different areas that we're talking about so that we're using the resources and we're uh, employing the people in the most strategic, sustainable, resilient manner possible because it looks like we're wasting tremendous amount of uh, energy and resources and allowing people to you know, live less than they should be living. So, so let me take you to a place we haven't talked about before. Uh, I teach a course at NDU, co-teach, on something called wicked problems. And a wicked problem is an area where there's no agreement on the definition of the problem, much less on the solution. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, one of the things we've been looking at in this is the uh, replacement of labor by automation and artificial intelligence uh, and the national security implications of that over between now and 2030. And the question is um, not so much the developed world, that's a problem, but what happens in the youth bulge areas mm -hmm. of sub-Saharan Africa, the Islamic world, and South Asia if there are no entry-level jobs? And so no stake in the international system, no... Uh, so what can you do to reduce pressures for migration and radicalization by focusing on the development of local uh, economically viable and resilient communities that are culturally acceptable and want people to stay and not migrate. Mm -hmm. So the project is called Brocade, Building Resilient Opportunities in Culturally Aware Diverse Environments. I love your acronym. It's always an acronym, but give it to us one more time. Brocade, Brocade. Building Resilient Opportunities, Culturally Aware Diverse Environments. Okay. And the focus is on using the sharing economy, peering economy approaches applied in local communities with with the platforms of Star Times. So there's a lady named Robin uh, <coughs> Chase who has written a book called Peers, Inc. And Robin's the co-founder of Zipcar, so she has some credibility mm -hmm. in this space. And in this Peers, Inc., the inks are the industrial level platforms like Google, uh, Google search engines and the internet right. uh, that peers, individuals, can use to innovate and develop ideas. So this is how Airbnb builds out 650,000 beds in four years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So could you take this in local communities, Maasai may still want to hunt lions, some people want to do this under Sharia law, but you look at the explosion of innovation in, in urban agriculture, for example. You look at uh, local production through 3D printing, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. I don't know which will succeed, the high altitude balloons or the satellites, the drones, there's going to be 4G global internet in the next five, ten years. Right. That brings with it learning, telemedicine, but it also brings the ability of with the vocal inter interfaces, oral interfaces, the illiterate populations around the world to engage in the knowledge of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're doing it by voice, they're doing it by image. They don't just have to necessarily be you know, reading literate in order to be able to participate. So you can put together about 12 of these different platforms in Robbins, I mean, apply them to local communities, use the Star Tides ideas, mm -hmm. and that would be how I try to get to the point about how do you build economically viable, resilient, culturally acceptable communities that would reduce some of these pressures. Now looking at this, we've absolutely, anytime we get together we always run out of time, but looking at this in about uh, 30 to 40 seconds, how do you think this is going to be implemented, say over the next 5, 10, 15 years? Okay, so we're actually kicking off a, with a conference on this next month at George Mason. And the first thing is governance. How do you determine what's, um, what's justice, what's fairness, how would you manage these in the different communities? Uh, then what would be some pilots? And then the question, well, how do you tie the technologies into those communities? That's the second part. That's so fantastic. Thank you for being here. We've got a few more uh, seconds to, to go on. But I really appreciate you being here and sharing these outstanding people that you brought with you. And, and then introducing us to Jim Kraft. He's absolutely a fantastic guy. And um, you know, what you're doing is just going beyond the payoff. And I think this tides and star tides. I was introduced to about six years ago. It just keeps growing and it's more wonderful than ever. So it's just really nicely, nicely done.